finally my prayers have been answered and Xiaomi today have globally released the S1 and S1 Active smartwatches that tick all of the right boxes for me. Long battery life, snappy OS, AMOLED display, NFC payments, smart home control and most importantly packaged in an affordable price tag. This is exactly what I've been waiting for, but this doesn't mean that the smartwatches are perfect, because along with the hits, there are certainly a few misses. Welcome back to another episode of Stu's Reviews. If you find today's video helps you in any way, I would love it in return if you could hit that thumbs up, subscribe, and notification bell. And hopefully I'll be able to offer you some more advice in the future, but for now, Let's get stuck in. The S1 has actually been around since December, but the S1 Active is relatively new addition to this. And together, they're only just getting a global release, meaning that the full feature set has been optimized for the UK, EU, and US. And I mean the full feature set. Both of these watches have a 1.43 inch AMOLED display at a resolution of 326 PPI, which looks stunning. They've both got a PPG heart rate sensor, SPO2 sensor, gyroscope, accelerometer, a geomagnetic sensor, air pressure sensor, and dual band multi system GPS, which all together makes for a very comprehensive health tracking experience in over 117 different fitness modes. Along with this, they both use Bluetooth 5.2, have NFC payments, and even utilize built in Amazon Alexa. All of this with an absolutely astounding battery life that can last up to 24 days. The main difference between the two is the build. The S1 has a stainless steel body with sapphire crystal face and leather strap, whereas the S1 Active features a much lighter plastic body, a rubber strap, and I'm a big fan of the design of both. Although these are made by Xiaomi and the OS is called the MIUI Watch OS, you wouldn't be mistaken in thinking that there is a lot about the design and OS that is very similar and reminiscent of the Amazfit smartwatch lineup that I've been very fond of in the past. And that's a really good thing. It's simplistic, it's bright, it's easy to use, and there isn't much pomp about it. It all has the standard things that we've come to expect, such as notifications from apps, music control, and all manner of health-related functionality. But unfortunately, on the other hand, it also means that some of the interface that I didn't like from the Amazfit experience has reared its ugly head again, namely the omission of rich notifications and the fact that there's missing logos for many of the apps that you'll get notifications from, simply replaced by a generic looking icon which can make for a very messy notification timeline, quite difficult to see exactly what you've got. Now there's a very good reason for its similarity to the Amazfit lineup and that's because Xiaomi actually has a massive finger in the Amazfit pie, having backed them since conception, so it would be safe to say that there is definitely some inspiration and crossover here. But with that said, it's what's different that really sets the S1 series Series miles ahead of its closest comparisons and competitors within the same price bracket. The most notable of those features for me is the NFC capabilities. Now, followers of the channel will know that I've been screaming for a long time for NFC cap payment capabilities in the UK specifically from budget smartwatches by companies like Xiaomi and the closely related Amazfit. When the Amazfit GTR3 came out a few months back, I was at a complete loss as why yet again we weren't getting NFC payments. But all of that has now changed, and I can finally walk into my pub and buy a pint with my budget smartwatch. Mm. This new ability and the excitement that I have around it is a little bit overshadowed by a few small annoyances with the NFC payment process. And the first is support. Because I've managed to get hold of this prior to its official global launch, the supported banks and supported card lists aren't currently live, along with a few other features. But if we were to go by existing examples, the Mi Band 6, which gained NFC capability a couple of months ago, only supports Curve cards in the UK. Coincidentally, I've reviewed Curve a little while back because fintech stuff has always interested me. But in a nutshell, it's a free-to-use financial service that allows you to combine all of your payment cards into one single card and I'll drop a review below for you if you want to take a look at that and find out a bit more but the card I used in my example was the curve card but out of curiosity I tried setting up my Starling bank account with unfortunately no success 
I do know, however, that whatever it does support eventually will only be MasterCard for now, and the likes of other services such as Visa will remain unsupported. The second issue with the NFC payments is not so much the support, but the software itself. At the time of writing this review, there's only one way to pay from your watch, and that's raising your wrist, tapping the top right button, scrolling down to the wallet, and then pressing pay, at which point you've got 60 seconds to then scan your watch against the reader. This has to be one of the most convoluted methods of NFC payment in a smartwatch that I have ever seen. It's mad. As you know, in other smartwatches, a simple double tap of one of the buttons usually gives you a shortcut to pay, making the experience so much speedier. No shortcut currently exists in the S1 series. Thankfully, this is just a software oversight, and hopefully Xiaomi will see this feedback and make that change in future iterations, perhaps giving us control of what function the button on the bottom does when you press it, because as it stands, it can only trigger emergency calls to a predefined number or trigger a preset workout. But on the subject of working out, the workout and activity tracking element of the S1 series is very good indeed. 117 different algorithms to track activities ranging from standard stuff like running to more niche things like fencing and even racing cars. I mean, that's a bit insane. But if you don't select to do a workout manually, the OS does a great job understanding when you're doing an activity activity and automatically recommends tracking whatever you're doing. Perhaps what's even more interesting is the speed in which it automatically pauses this tracking for workouts like walking and running. When you come to a standstill, perhaps you're stopping for a second to grab a drink, it will automatically pause really quickly. And then when you continue to move again, it resumes tracking. And it does this ultimately to track your workout better and remove unwanted data from standstill segments. Now, we've seen this sort of thing before, but I've never seen a smartwatch do it so fast before. Although there is a caveat, and that it's not always the most accurate if you're doing a slower activity like walking whilst holding onto a dog lead or perhaps pushing a pram. It seems to have some difficulty understanding if you've stopped your workout or not. Of course, this doesn't happen in manually chosen workouts, and it's only in niche circumstances that I've come across this particular individual problem. Now, once you've done your workouts, you can see fitness-related metrics on the watch in the, in the individual apps or through the widget functionality, which can be customized through the companion app, which actually is another part of the overall experience that I will applaud. It is by far one of the most simple and user-friendly companion apps that I've seen, and it makes it really easy to view any recorded data, install new watch faces from the online store, and switch between watches, which in the past has been a horrible experience. Now it's super quick to essentially switch between your active and your non-active, for example. But that's not to say that everything about the app is quick. Updating the watch is horrendously slow straight out of the box, it took over 30 minutes to download the update, sync to the watch, and then install, during which time I couldn't touch the phone or the watch. Not really a great first impression, but with that said, once that's done, I've found very little to criticise about the app experience, which seems to work very consistently, which is quite impressive, actually, because it's mostly a brand new experience, having only just been updated with an overhauled interface and the added functionality, obviously, with the S1 watches, having NFC payments and Amazon Alexa support, which actually is another thing that makes these watches super special. Although I haven't been able to test this function out fully, because as mentioned, I'm using this prior to release, so some of the features have yet to be activated. But the watches have Alexa support built in as the voice assistant, which gives me the full functionality of the Echo voice service, and ultimately means that I can control my smart home devices and routines directly on my watch. I suspect integration of this will be very, very similar to the Amazfit lineup, which has the same support, and they work brilliantly with Alexa. But obviously it only works due to the inbuilt mic and speaker, which in turn is used for notifications and Bluetooth phone calls, another staple feature of some more expensive competitors. This speaker seems ample for quieter environments, and it can go quite loud. It isn't the most high-fidelity speaker I've ever heard, as you can tell, but it'll certainly do enough for smaller, quick calls. 
Although oddly, you can't make calls directly from the watch to numbers that you haven't called before, because there's no way to view your contacts list, only historic call lists. So it's great if you want to take a call, but less so if you want to make a call, because you're limited to those that have only called you before, which in my case is nobody. Again, I don't think this is a capability issue, but more of a misstep in the software development. And I'm hoping that eventually they implement the ability to import contact lists to make calls directly from the watch to contacts that haven't called me already. But let's talk about price because this is important. Now, on paper, everything I've discussed on their own without looking at the whole picture, the individual specifications of the S1 and S1 Active might not seem that special, but when you look at the picture as a whole, there aren't many competitors that have a battery that lasts several weeks, have NFC payments, 117 fitness tracking modes, Bluetooth calling, Alexa integration, and generally a positive experience for under £200. Now, because they haven't yet launched globally, at the time of filming this episode, I don't have the exact pricing available to me. But to my understanding, the S1 Active is around €170, Euros, which, if it is that price, is extremely reasonable considering the feature set. The S1 stainless steel with the sapphire crystal face is a bit more expensive at €229, Euros. but you don't need to spend that extra money unless it's a real style preference to go for the stainless steel. Now, this price might have changed slightly at launch, and obviously if it's gone up, then my opinion might change slightly. Anything over €190 Euros for the S1 Active, and I guess it would start to lose some of that budget charm for me. But if it stays at 170 or under, then that's a real win in my eyes. But to conclude and summarise my thoughts on the new S1 series, there's a hell of a lot to love here, and it's exactly what I've been waiting for from a budget smartwatch. But there are a few things that still feel unfinished, like the truncated method of payment, or the fact I can't make calls directly from the watch to people that haven't called me. But thankfully, these are just some of the software issues, and I'm hoping that these will be improved soon after launch by Xiaomi after getting this feedback but the future is looking extremely promising and i cannot wait to see what the future holds for these watches and smart watches from uh, Xiaomi directly it's a fantastic start and despite the odd quirks in the user experience i think these watches could already be a contender for one of the best budget smart watches of 2022 and that concludes today's episode if you enjoyed it and it helped you understand the S1 series or if it helped you make a choice to get one or not, don't forget to hit that thumbs up. And in return, if you want to see more of me, hit that subscribe and notification bell. And if you do end up getting one or don't end up getting one, let us know what you think of the S1 series in the comments below so we can all have a good chin wag. And I'll see you back for another episode of Stu's Reviews soon.